All right, everybody. Friday, the last Friday. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I am. <laughs> Excuse me? What? what did you say? Oh, good morning, Vietnam. Good morning, Vietnam. Oh. Does it feel that way? Yeah, you guys like feel your. Oh, really? Is this is is that a description of your assignment three submission or? <laughs> All right. So so today my goal is to uh, kind of reboot Wednesday's lecture and try to have things make more sense. Right. Uh, I I realized as I was lecturing Wednesday that I had made these terrible and clumsy mistakes on how the material was presented, and I think things didn't make any sense. How many people thought that things made sense on Wednesday? Oh, OK. Well, good. <laughs> maybe, maybe what I've actually done is, is, you know sometimes when you can't remember what someone's name is, and like, you know it's one of two things, and then you, you kind of outthink yourself. So maybe what I've done is I've confused the material to agree that nobody will understand it. So OK, but anyway, so today we're really just going to try to focus on finishing up our discussion of, of full virtualization. Right? I gave up on preventing presenting parallel virtualization. We just don't have time. It's fine. Um, but we'll talk about full virtualization. We'll go through a couple of examples of how uh, traps are handled. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the, you know, if, if we have time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some of the go ugly, gory details of um, the x86 architecture in particular, what makes this difficult, right? And, and some of what VMware is, has innovated on. All right, so, all right, so uh, Monday, Monday morning, uh, I will be here at 8 AM. And I will have a, uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to prepare, but I think I'll be able to answer questions about the exam. Uh, we'll do kind of a general free-flowing, uh, freewheeling sort of review session. Uh, and that's going to be what we'll do on Monday. I'll prob probably what I'll do is I'll just put together a compilation of slides from, the, from throughout the class. And we'll walk through kind of you know, things from day one. We'll take a journey down memory lane and, and talk about all the great and wonderful things that we've learned this semester and you know, whatever. Uh, or maybe we'll just show a movie if nobody comes. Right? Um, that's probably so, so if nobody's here at 8 a.m., I'm, I'm going to turn on the Matrix and start watching. Um, but you know, please show up. This is your practice at getting up at 8 a.m., uh, which is something that you know, even, even I will have to work at a little bit. So, but anyway, I'll be here. Uh, maybe we'll have some goodies uh, you know, for people who show up uh, to sort of help you guys wake up a little bit. But, but we're going to do review. 8 a.m., 8 to 10. 8 to 10. Two hours. Two whole hours. A special double episode. Um, all right. So, and then, and so remember, we, I, I made you guys this deal about the course feedback. So I went. And, and I made this deal after looking at the feedback rates, because there's like one person from 421 that just filled out the feedback form, right? There's like, a, actually, 521 people are doing better. There were multiple people that filled out the form for 521. But they must be angry or something. <laughs> you know, they, 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 they got in there right away. Um, but, but yeah, so the combined, the combined participation, who, who remembers what the deal is? If the combined participation rate for both classes goes above 70%, what will happen? I will release one of the exam questions on, you know, let's see, the exam is Monday, so I would release it like Saturday night, right? Giving you guys a day to look at it and prepare an answer that you can write when you come and take the exam on Monday morning, right? And if the participation level crosses 80%, what will happen? Two questions. Two questions. 90%. Three. There is no way we're going to do 100%, but in the bizarre likelihood that that happens, what would happen? No final exam. <laughs> sure. OK. No, I'm not going to promise that. <laughs> Got some skilled hackers in this room. You know, some ballot stuffing. If you, OK, how about this? If you get the participation rate, uh, this, if you get the participation rate to 110%, right, <laughs> then maybe we'll, we'll, give, we'll, we'll, we'll give an exam. Um, all right, so, so please fill out the form. This is really useful. Uh, you know, and it's kind of sad to see that no one has filled it out yet. But I, I, don't know, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it asks you. But you know, uh, you know, have, have fun with it and, and leave, leave feedback that will help us improve the class as we move forward. All right, so assignment three is due on Wednesday. Um, can, you know, watch your email uh, this week. We might have try to take some of the TA time and sort of move it all into the front half of the week. So we give you guys a chance to come in and get some sort of last minute help on assignment three. Um, you know, if, if, if you're in a good place for assignment three, you're at the point now where your system works with a lot of memory. 
right, without swapping. But you know, if you put eight or 16 megabytes in it, you can run all the tests and, and things work, right? If you're in that place, you're in a good place. If you're not, you're not in a good place. So it's, it's time to get to work because the swapping will take a little while. Um, all right, any questions about logistics, incentives, et cetera? Assignment three. All right. OK, so on, on Monday, really the only thing I think that I presented coherently was poten potentially some reasons why we might think about virtualizing uh, hardware, creating a virtual machine, and in creating a virtual machine that was real enough that we could actually run a operating system inside it, right? So, so operating systems inside operating systems. And I guess maybe you could even run little mini operating systems inside your operating systems, right? So it ends up being this like uh, Russian egg sort of thing, right? Russian doll sort of uh, stacking sort of situation. But uh, who remembers some of the reasons that we might, we might want to do this, right? Um, or, or who has, okay, sorry, questions first. Who has any questions about Monday's material? A lot of it is going to, sorry, Wednesday, it's Friday. Wednesday's material, a lot of it's going to reappear in about 10 minutes. So any questions about what we covered on Wednesday as far as motivations for virtualization? Right. All right, so let's review. What were some of the problems with operating systems that we uh, identified together particularly in the area of hardware coupling. So, so what are some of the, uh, the weaknesses that operating systems have that would lead us to create little virtual machines for them to live in, rather than the physical machines that were perhaps more common 10, 20 years ago? Right? So what are, what, are, what are some of the problems with the, in, the, the physical, the real physical environment? What, 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 can you, what are the things that become hard to do, or what are the problems when you actually install a real operating system on a real machine? Hard for multiple operating systems to run. It's really impossible, right? Um, because the operating system is used to being in charge, right? It's the boss. So it doesn't like to have or doesn't really understand. It really has no way of, of tolerating the presence of other, other systems, right? You know, it's going to say, this is my machine, you know? And, and you try to run another operating system, then I don't even know what would happen. I just I don't think that's even possible, right? It just doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so yeah, so I have this um, you know problem where you know I might want to run multiple operating systems, okay? And and again, that's a little that that, that rationale is a little semi geeky, right? What else? What are other problems? Start calling on people. All right, left side of the room. I'm picking on you guys again today. What were some of the other problems with this coupling between hardware? And, what's that? Isolation. Isolation. Okay. No, you're getting ahead of me. We're going to come back to isolation, right? We're going to come back to isolation <laughs> in the next slide. But what were some of the other problems with with really with creating this weird sort of marriage between hardware and the operating system? This this group of three. Somebody will contribute. No ideas. Anybody from the left side of the room? Right side of the room? Nothing. Ooh, wow. Again, maybe people weren't here on Wednesday or just. Right, what about, what about if you're, you know, so this has happened to some people in this class, right? What about if your machine dies, right? Carl? Server migration from one machine to another. Yeah, I mean, transfer stuff from one machine to another. So, so some of you guys have had this unfortunate. Uh, uh, incident where like your, your machine is crashed, okay? Now, if you had been snapshotting the state of your CS421 virtual machine, you would have been able to reload that on another machine. And I think people have actually done this when they've brought a new machine to transfer, you know, basically the entire system onto a new machine. That's possible, right? It works. Does it work? It does work, it does work right? Easy. Yeah, very easy, very nice, right? Take, take an entire machine and just move it. Easy. The problem you guys have had when your machines have died is you haven't been snapshotting the virtual machine, so that becomes more hard, right? So if your machine dies and you lose the virtual machine state, then you're, then you're in trouble, right? But in general, the ability to put your arms around an entire machine that's being implemented in software and just pick it up as a bunch of bytes and dump it onto another machine is kind of nice, right? Um, so what else? There's like at least one more thing here. Maybe I'll give people another hint. What, do, you know, what about 
um, you know, uh, provisioning your system. How do, how do you give resources or grant resources to, to, to your system when it's running on bare metal? Yeah, you know, if I, if I want to add memory or do other things, you know, it ends up being really difficult. And what this means is that I have to really try to make a best guess effort up front to provision machines, right? So, the, so on, on, on real hardware, you know, I'm, I'm limited to the capabilities of the actual bare metal, right? And if I want to change capabilities, I've got to change metal, right? On virtualized setup, if I want to change, you know, if I want to add memory to my EC2 instance, I shut it down, I click a different box, and I reboot it, and suddenly it's, you know, got twice as much memory, right? That's pretty cool. All right. What about application isolation? You brought this up. So, so to, to what degree do operating systems not so, so, okay, one thing that operating systems do well when it comes to isolation. What's one resource that operating systems are good at isolating uh, between multiple processes? Potential exam question. Okay. What's that? Processor is memory, right? I mean, processor's kind of clean, right? I yank something off the processor, there's no trace that it was ever there, right? Memory, if I do properly, I can allow some sharing in memory, which is nice, but in general, usually most, the, the default settings for memory <laughs> hopefully, for when you guys are doing your virtual memory system, should be unshared, right? And certainly we don't want any accidental share. Um, but in many ways, you know, operating systems leak a lot of information through a variety of channels, right, that, that causes other applications to be aware of the presence of, of app other applications on the system, right? So what's one way in which this happens? File system. File system. Ah, all right. You know, and, and of course, the file system actually, in some ways, gives birth to all of these other problems, right? I've got software setups that are very specific to a machine. You know, uh, I might need to tune the kernel for a particular application. And, and as we talked about when we talked about performance, that tuning process, if it's, if it's too specific to that application, might end up breaking things for other applications, right? So there's a whole host of, of different problems, here, right? And again, there are certain cases where you can't actually even get a certain application supported now, in our modern virtualized world, if it's running alongside anything else, right? So essentially, what, what has happened, right? Before we had this vision of, you know, operating systems supporting multiple applications, multi-programming, multiple users, multiple different things happening. What, what have we regressed to? What do we, what do we have now? Carl, you're waving a finger in the air. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of that way, right? I mean, you have, a, you have this, this, it's literally like a machine that is built and customized for a single application, right? So, you know, you get this virtual machine image that comes with SQL Server and a kernel that is customized exactly for SQL Server, and that's it, right? And you put that thing up, and it's got a port number, and that's all it does, right? And, and but yeah, so we've had this interesting progression where we've essentially started to, to, to link these two things very, 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 very directly, right? And virtualization is part of what makes that possible. Okay. All right, so any other questions about motivation? Why do this crazy virtualization thing in the first place, right? We're going we're, we're, we're gonna to get kind of, you know, really trappy and down into the belly of the beast today with how this stuff actually works out at the, you know, at, at the instruction by instruction level. So this is a good chance to try to wrap your mind around why this is a good idea, right? All right. Okay, so, so, so let me back up a little bit. I think last time I, I got a little bit of ahead, of, ahead of things, right? So remember that our, our, our overall goal here when we're talking about full virtualization is to take an unmodified operating system, right? So if I could simply stop your, your machine that you have running, take you know, the disk and load it into a file on another machine and start that up running in a virtual machine, I want to run a complete unmodified operating system inside that virtual machine. Right? I don't want to have to make any changes to the operating system. I don't want the operating system to know at all. Right? And do you guys remember, I mean, why, why is this difficult? I don't think I should have this. Should I have this thing up on, about VMware? I feel like I'm kind of hawking their product or something like that. Anyway, I mean, VMware is the thing that people are familiar with, but there's a lot of other ways to do this. VMware was responsible for some, I think, the earlier ideas about how to do this, specifically for x86. But, but in no way am I endorsing VMware. Right? Uh, let's say give me a lot of money, and then I'll endorse them happily. Um, so so why, why is this difficult? What's hard about this? Right, I mean, operating systems are used to running with kernel privilege. 
right? This is the big challenge. They're used to running in privileged mode. They're used to having access to all the resources on the system. And the challenge in virtualization is, how do we relax that requirement and allow them to run essentially in it? So, so again, think about it this way. Once you create a virtual machine and start an operating system up running in it, you have two operating systems running on the system. They're both used to running in privileged mode. They both think that they should be privileged, right? You know, your, 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 window, you know, your Windows 7 guest OS doesn't, doesn't want you to tell it that it's not a real operating system, you know? It's not the operating system that you've chosen to manage your precious hardware. It's just running in a VM because you need it to do like two things a month. It doesn't, it doesn't want to know that. It doesn't, that would hurt its feelings, right? Um, so so it, it's, it's like it wants to think it's special. It wants to think like, I'm the operating system. I, this is, and again, like, I don't know why my machine is so dinky and slow, but hey, you know, this is the best machine I've got. I'm going you know, to do my best. Um, so, so there's a couple of problems here, right? So the first is, is really the, the guest OS is going to try to execute these privilege instructions, right? The second problem is that we, now we're playing the shell game because there are traps that are going to be created inside the virtual machine that will need to be handled by the guest operating system. Right? So, so really, there's two, there's two types of situations that the virtual machine monitor needs to handle properly. The first situation is traps by applications running in, inside the virtual machine. Now, what has to happen? So I'm, you know, I've created a little MIPS virtual machine, and my MIPS application calls system call. Who is supposed to handle that system call? Who has to handle that system call? The host OS or the guest OS? I heard people whisper it. Anybody want to venture a guess? What's that? The guest OS is, has to handle it. Why does the guest OS have to handle it? Yeah, I mean, it, you might you might be a total you might be running a totally different operating system with the different calling you know different calling conventions for your system calls system call numbers that do different things right. What's the other reason right? Let's say let's say I'm running an identical copy of Ubuntu inside a virtual machine running on Ubuntu. I don't know actually there's a lot of good reasons to do it. I think about it, but uh, but why still why would I why does the guest OS have to eventually handle this trap? Then. OK, so, so, so save that answer and come back to it, because we'll get to that with the next level of traps. But, but again, so it's sort of more fundamental. Right, so does the host OS, like, again, does the host OS know anything about the applications that are running inside the guest OS? Not really, right? It just knows that, all it knows is that someone told me that I should send the traps that are generated by this application to this virtual machine monitor, right? That's all it knows. It doesn't have any idea that there's an application. So your, you know, your host OS, what does the entire virtual machine look like to the host OS in a full virtualization scenario? What does it look like? Keith? It looks like an application. Looks like an application, right? All it knows is that application generated a fault of some kind, right? And the only thing we're going to do special here is we're going to have the host OS use the virtual machine monitor to handle those faults that are generated by that application. Right? That's the only thing, because the host OS cannot handle those faults. It doesn't know. It doesn't know what's happening. There's all sorts of state inside the virtual machine that's completely opaque to it. Right? So that's, that's the only thing we have to do. All right, sec second thing. So what happens if, um, Ben, we're coming to your answer, right? So, so the guest OS is going to try to execute these privileged instructions. Right? Who, who has to handle, so when the guest OS tries to like make a change to the TLB, or modify page tables, or change the privilege level, who has to handle that? Who, who needs to handle that, that, that trap? That? Who's what application or what process is responsible for the state of the virtual machine? The virtual machine monitor, right? So this is the reason that all these traps created by this application have to be handed to the virtual machine monitor, right? Because 
if, for example, the, the guest OS tries to modify some state about the machine, the machine state that has to get modified is actually the virtual machine state, right? not the physical. In, in most cases, right? In some cases, we talked about instructions that were safe to execute on the, vir on the real machine, right? But in some cases, the virtual machine monitor needs to know that it tried to load a TLB entry, right? Because the virtual machine monitor needs to check to make sure that's safe, right? So, so again, one of the ways that we keep isolation between the virtual machine and the physical machine is that we make sure that the virtual machine monitor sees any changes to the machine state that the guest OS tries to make, right? Because those changes need to be, to be checked, right? All right, so, so I think we talked about this a little bit, right? Um, if, if we run the guest OS with kernel privileges, we just can't do this, right? There's no way to, there's real no, no way to do this safely because this means that the guest OS is, even if, you know, in, in the best case, right, the guest OS is completely functional and well-behaved, right? But the problem is that this, this, this violates our safety requirement that we had for virtual machines, right? This means that the guest OS can essentially load. So for example, if I, if I create a virtual machine that uses you know, 512 megabytes of the memory on my system, if I allow the guest OS inside that virtual machine to run with privileged mode, it can load TLB entries that point to any memory address anywhere on the machine, right? So I can't do this, right? So this is, this is why I can't run this, the guest OS with, in privileged mode, okay? Now, just again, I think we went over this a little bit last time. So what happens if we run the guest OS with user privileges, right? This is our, this is our big trick, right? We're going to take the kernel and we're just going to execute it with user privileges. What happens now? What's, what's the kernel? What's going to, you know, if, if you just took your kernel and you, you yanked away its privilege level behind its back, what, what would happen eventually? What, would happen, what happens if a user program tries to execute an instruction that requires some sort of privilege that it doesn't have? How does it get killed? What's the first thing that happens? An exception, right? Or this is what needs to happen, right? So if, if your, you know, you can try this on MIPS, right? If your user program tries to, you know, write to the TLB without the correct privileges, that will cause an exception, right? And it will, jump to the, it will jump to the operating system and start handling the exception, right? And the operating system will see, hey, that user program isn't supposed to be able to modify the TLB, and it will be killed, right? But the first thing that happens is that it is an exception occurs. This is what needs to happen, right? This is critical because this is how the virtual machine monitor is going to get control of the system, right? So the, the, the critical trick here is that by running the guest operating system in user mode, on a machine that generates exceptions. This is the other critical part. The machine has to generate an exception when I try to execute a privileged instruction. As long as that happens, I have a chance to run, and the virtual machine monitor has a chance to inspect that instruction to make sure it's OK. Right? If I didn't have this property, I mean, if, if, the, if the machine allows user programs to execute privileged instructions, it's totally broken. Right? Like, that machine is just a bad machine. Right? But if the machine doesn't cause an exception or if it like, kills the process itself or something weird, right? or if it does something weird to the state of the machine when this happens, that also causes problems. Right? So keep this in mind when we come back a little bit later in class. We'll talk a little bit about the x86 and part of why this is such a mess on the x86. Right? All right. So again, ideally what happens is when privileged instructions are run by the guest OS at, user privilege, at a user privilege level, the CPU is going to trap Right? And what's going to happen? It's going to trap into which operating system? The host. Right? It's going to trap in the host OS. The host OS is going to hand this off to the virtual machine monitor. And the virtual machine monitor is going to figure out what to do. Right? The trap is handled by the VMM. Right? And again, so, so if, and we'll come back to this example, but if the virtual, if the process is doing something OK, if the guest OS is doing something OK to the virtual machine, then the instruction is allowed to complete. Right? But because I need to preserve safety, I need to inspect those instructions. Right? So this whole approach is known as trap and emulate. Right? I trap, in order to run a virtual machine, in order to run privileged code inside that virtual machine, I trap instructions that change the state of the machine, and I emulate or inspect those instructions to make sure that they're OK. 
right? And, and so, and we also, if, we, if a particular hardware instruction set has this property, right, that when privileged instructions are executed, they cause an exception, and the other thing is that privileged instructions have to work the same way in user mode and in kernel mode, right? That's another requirement for an architecture to be considered classically virtualizable, right? These architectures are easy to virtualize because what happens is the guest, the, the virtual machine monitor gets control from the host OS any time a trap happens, right? And these, so, and these can be virtualized using this approach of we a trap and emulate a trap and inspect, okay? So again, now I'm the virtual machine monitor, right? And the, and the host OS has been talked into handling, to, to handing traps to me to handle, right? So I'm the virtual machine monitor application and I get a trap, right? The host OS has trapped into and it's handed off the trap to me. What two things could have happened, right? Or what two broad classes of things? In, in general, there's two categories of, of traps that the virtual machine monitor is going to see, right? What's the first category? So, so what's, what, are, what are the normal category of traps that happen even on physical machines, right? When do traps occur and what happens when a trap occurs? So things like system calls and hardware exceptions and stuff like that. And where do those traps have to go? Where does the VMM have to send those types of traps? The guest OS, the guest OS right? So any trap that would normally be handled by the operating system has to be vectored to the guest operating system, right? That includes you know, changes to hardware state that the guest operating system needs to know about and system calls and other requests by processes running inside the virtual machine for guest OS support. What class of traps is handled by the virtual machine monitor directly? No. What class of traps? So again, virtual machine monitor, right? I'm running the guest OS in user mode. Normally, operating systems just are allowed to change the, any state of hardware they want to. Right? That's, that's kind of what kernel privilege allows me to do. On a virtual machine, what happens? So the second class of traps, I don't know if it's actually up on the slide, right? If the trap is caused by an application, I need to pass the trap to the guest OS. This is not completely true, right? The other class of traps I would need to pass to the guest OS would be traps that would be caused by virtualized hardware in the virtual machine, right? So if my virtual disk has completed a write, then I need to trap back into the guest OS so that it can update you know, state indicating that the write is complete, right? But if the trap is caused by the guest OS trying to adjust the state of the machine, right, then the virtual machine monitor will handle that directly, right? Because the virtual machine monitor is, is monitoring the state of the virtual machine. This is making more sense to me now. Maybe you guys are bored, but, but just for, for my own sanity, okay? So let's, so let's talk about how this works, right? We'll go through two examples. Um, so, so again, the requirement here is that traps and exceptions originate inside the VM must be handled by the VM, the virtual machine monitor, right? They're passed off to the virtual machine monitor to handle, okay? And remember, most instructions that are executed both by the guest OS and by applications running inside the guest OS are allowed to simply use the processor normally. They don't, if I was emulating every instruction, this would be way too slow. So who could give me some examples of, of, of an instruction that would be safe to execute without, without involving the virtual machine monitor at all? An ad, right? All I'm changing is the register state, right? I'm a process, I'm allowed to, to change the register state on the machine, right? What, what's another example? Subtract, okay, fair enough. <laughs> Multiply, divide, you know, yeah. So, you know, and, any, any, and things that, you know, uh, moving arguments between registers, et cetera, et cetera. What about, okay, so second category, what about stuff that, that accesses memory? What about addresses that access memory? Load word, store word? What do I, what, what, what's a little bit tricky about those? What's that? So they have to be translated, but, but what do I need to do before I allow the virtual machine monitor to, um, to execute or, or things running inside the virtual machine monitor to execute those instructions? The first time they're executed, right? So the first time the, there's a trap in the virtual machine monitor that needs to gain access to memory, what do I need to make sure in the, in the virtual machine monitor or in the host operating system? 
Yeah, that it has permission to access that memory. So I've, ch I've carved off a chunk of memory on the system for the virtual machine to use. And if the virtual machine tries to access a page in another part of the system, I can't allow that. Right? So that needs to be stopped. Right? And then what, what, are some what are some instructions that we probably need to trap and inspect every time? Right? So what's, what's one that you guys are using for assignment three? That's, a, that's an example. What's the, what's the main piece of hardware you guys are manipulating for assignment three? The TLB. And, and th th here's the thing, right? So I had this, I, I realized this after last class I was talking to somebody, and I realized that we want the guest operating system and applications inside the guest operating system to use the TLB on the system. They have to use the TLB. If they don't use the TLB, memory access is way too slow, OK? So I'm not going to trap every, that, that, that's why I'm not going to trap and inspect every load and store word. If I did that, essentially, like, I'd be pre-virtual memory and the system would be so dog slow you'd never be able to use it, right? So what I do is that when the guest operating system tries to modify the TLB of the real machine, that's the point at which the virtual machine monitor steps in and makes sure that that modification is OK. But if the modification is OK, it's allowed to proceed. Right? So while the guest OS and applications are running inside the virtual machine, they're using the TLB just like a process would. Right? The only change is that the guest operating system is allowed to modify the TLB, but all modifications to the TLB that the guest operating system tries to perform have to be looked at by the virtual machine monitor to make sure that they're OK, that I'm not trying to map some piece of memory that the virtual machine hasn't been granted access. Right? All right. So again, so, so what are the steps? What happens? First example, application running inside the virtual machine makes a system call, right? So syscall instruction on MIPS, right? What's the first thing that happens? We went over this on, this is an example from Wednesday, so I think I was trying to cover this at the end of class, but I don't think it made any sense. All right, first thing that happens. I execute syscall, application running inside my guest OS. Yeah? So it calls us a trap. Where does it trap to? The host OS. All traps are handled by the host OS, right? Where does the trap go next? To the VMM. Carl has this habit of whispering answers. Yeah. <laughs> but they're usually right. That's the thing. You're whispering right answers. Um, all right, so the VMM inspects the, so the VMM looks at the trap, right? So remember, there's two classes of traps that the VMM is going to handle, right? This is one, and the VMM knows the state of the machine, right? The VMM knows, hey, right now, the virtual machine is running an application that just tried to make a system call, right? And so now the next thing I need to do is I need to pass that trap into the guest operating system, OK? So the guest operating system starts to run, right? And the guest operating system is going to write, you know, run the code that you guys wrote for assignment two. It's going to handle the system call, right? If there are any exceptions that are produced, those would be, need to be handled in the way that we'll talk about next. But let's say that all the mappings are there, so it just copies the data out. And then it calls return from exception. So assuming MIPS is a virtualizable architecture, and I'm actually not even sure it is, but what, is RF, what does that instruction have to do? Right? So the operating system is done. Now it executes this return from exception instruction that's supposed to lower the privilege level. Right? The funny thing is the privilege level is not even high. Right? The privilege of the hasn't even been set, but now I'm executing RFE. So what needs to happen now? So essentially, I need to get back to the VMM. And hopefully the way this happens is that I trap back into the host operating system. That trap is handled back to the VMM, and the VMM sees, oh, OK, the guest operating system is done executing the system call. I know where the caller was. I'll just pass the arguments back to the caller and restart the instruction. Right? All right. So let's do a more fun example. Right? What about a TLB fault caused by an application running inside the guest operating system? Okay? So process executes an instruction, a load word or a store, that tries to map a piece of memory that it hasn't used before, but it has access to. This is a valid mapping. It's not in the TLB. So what's the first thing that happens? Right, got a trap to the host OS. Okay, next thing that happens. Goes to the VMM, right? Hand the trap to the VMM. What does the VMM say? Who needs to handle this? 
guest operating system, right? Generated by an application, put the guest operating system in charge, right? The guest operating system is the one that's storing all the information about the process address translation, so the guest OS or the VMM isn't going to handle this fault. It has no idea, you know? Like here then, there's a guest operating system running in there that has its own idea of what all these mappings are, and that's who's maintaining the mapping, right? So, it, you know, the host OS can't translate the TLB fault. The guest, the VMM can't translate it either, right? The only person that knows how to translate this is the guest OS, right? So I get to the guest OS, pass the control. Now, what is the guest OS going to do? I'm on the fault handling path. I look up the translation. I find a translation. What do I do? I write it in the TLB. And what happens when I write it into the TLB? Carl's whispering again. I fault back to the host OS, right? I just tried to execute a privileged instruction, and I'm not a privileged, you know, I'm not in privileged mode, right? Now what happens? Back to the VMM. Now what does the VMM do? Sees if it's okay, right? This is an instruction that is doing what? It's trying to modify the state of the virtual machine, right? That's what this instruction is doing. Okay, I look at it, I say it's generated by the host OS, sorry, the guest OS. Man, this is why it's so hard to teach, it's too much terminology. Um, and it adjusts the state of the virtual machine appropriately, and essentially what's going to happen? What's it going to, what's it going to allow to, to occur? I did a TLB write or something, right? What's going to happen? It's just going to allow the write to happen, right? It's going to look at it, it's going to say, okay, this is a page that's inside the virtual machine, that's okay, and it's just going to allow that write to take place, right? So this is, this is essentially how this would happen, right? Yeah, so the, the, the VMM, that's a, good, that's a good point, right? So the VM, I, I don't know exactly how this works, but the VMM has to have some ability at least, you know, you can imagine the minimal ability the VMM has to have is the, guest op, the host operating system has to be willing to handle traps to the VMM that are only generated by that application. So this is, kind, this, this is potentially safe, right? Like, but, I, but yeah, the VMM has to, has to, I think, run in kernel mode, right? So usually there's some kernel drivers you have to install to get this to work. All right, any other questions about full virtualization? All right. So, unfortunately, so, so keep in mind, right, when we talk about hardware virtualization, virtual machines, what we're talking about virtualizing is an instruction set, right? So that's what people talk about virtualizing the x86 architecture. It's really hard to virtualize. I mean, that's what we're doing here. We're actually virtualizing the machine. The machine interface is the hardware instruction set. Unfortunately, the x86 is really, you know, if you were choosing an architecture to virtualize, I think most people would have said the x86 would be one of the last choices, right? Unfortunately, what was also true about x86? Everybody uses it, right? <clears throat> um, so, you know, there, there were, there were so if you look at the x86 uh, instruction set, it's not classically virtualizable. And there's a number of instructions that cause problems of various kinds. So there's some instructions that behave differently if you execute them in user or kernel mode. Like they set part of a register or they don't set part of a register or whatever. And then there's other instructions that don't trap correctly, right? They actually don't generate an exception when they should. They just fail in some weird way, right? So if you run them in, 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 in user mode, again, they try to write part of a register, but that register is privileged, and so that write fails, but the instruction just completes, right, having written only part of the register. <laughs> anyway, so, so there were all these problems with the x86, right? And, and, and VMware was the, yeah. Um, and so, you know, and, but, you know, I mean, fair enough, right? I mean, when, when the x86 was being designed, uh, well, actually, that's not true. I mean, virtualization as an idea, hardware virtualization as an idea goes back to the 70s. Right? So I don't want to give these guys too much credit, but the x86 wasn't clearly designed to be virtualizable in this nice way. Right? Um, and and what, what VMware did to allow the x86 to be virtualizable, and I'm not going to get too many details here, but there's a lot of information, actually. It's pretty cool. There's, they've actually written some really nice papers about this, and they've got a lot of information up on their website. It's kind of neat to look at, especially if you're kind of like a low-level hardware person and you like this stuff. Um, they came up with this clever solution to this problem. And, and what it involves is, is, is actually doing on-the-fly binary translation, right? So how many people are familiar with like JIT and other sort of like on-the-fly code uh, uh, munging techniques, right? So, so the Java has a just-in-time compilation uh, technique that is in similar in certain you know, intellectual ways to this. But what I'm going to do 
is as the virtual machine is executing, as the virtual machine monitor is, is handling faults, and, and remember, the virtual machine monitor sees all the faults and all the memory that would be accessed by anything inside the virtual machine. Any code page that's being run is first going to be seen by the VMM before it is allowed to be used by anything inside the virtual machine. Right? So this gives us the ability to do this. When the virtual machine monitor sees code pages being loaded and potentially executed, it translates them. Right? And what it does is it removes or uh, works around these kinks in the, oh, uh, blah, 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 in the x86 architecture. Right? So it loads up the page and it looks to see if that page is executing any instructions that have these unfortunate problems. And then it generates new binary sequences, right? which are then executed by things inside the virtual machine. Right? So this is very clever. Right? It's, and it, and you know, if, you, if you read their marketing literature, it's like, at the time, people believed that the x86 was impossible to virtualize. Right? And, and, you know, and they got to work, so that's, that's pretty neat. Um, and, you know, and there's all these nice tricks that you can use to improve performance. Right? And one of the things they do that's kind of obvious is they cache the translations. Right? So they don't perform the translation multiple times. Once they've translated a code page, they store that code. Right? And you can imagine that there's all sorts of gory details here that probably will thrill people who are interested in this stuff. Like, for example, you, know, you, have, to you have to adjust all the relocation things. And, uh, anyway, so, so I'll, I'll let you guys look at the details. But it's a neat idea. Right? Conceptually, it's a simple idea. You know? Look at the code. Find instructions that are likely to cause problems or that I know are going to cause problems and rewrite them to safe instruction sequences. Right? And that's kind of, this is how this is done. Right? And you know, hopefully if I can do this well, I don't take too much of a performance hit. Right? And depending on what you're doing, they have you know, numbers that indicate that the performance overhead of this is, is OK. Right? Because the, ni the nice thing about x86 or any other architecture is that most instructions do not, first of all, most instructions don't modify the machine state. Right? And second of all, most instructions uh, in on x86 are virtualizable. And I can just allow them to, to run directly and wait for them to cause traps. All right, I just, I just pointed this out. OK. Oh, oh, I like this kind of, I like this comparison. OK. So, so just step back a minute. I, I want to draw a parallel here that, that might be instructive with, with virtual memory. Right? So virtual memory is another area where I am virtualizing hardware. Right? Hardware here is memory, RAM. The, the, virtuali the virtualization is virtual memory, right? Virtual addresses, OK? So what's the mem who remembers what the memory interface is? Interface to full hardware is the full instruction set. Memory, load and store, right? Simple. Load word, store word, you know, and, and you know, different instruction sets have different collection of addresses, uh, sorry, different collections of instructions that modify memory. But basically, they're loads and stores, right? Put and get. How do we ensure safety? For virtual memory, uh, how do we how do we make sure you know one of the reasons for virtualizing this is to be able to, to to provide isolations right so how do we ensure that this is happening safely? Other than write good code for assignment three, I mean, I mean again remember uh, what what does the operating system get to do any time a virtual address is 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 accessed or at least the first time it's accessed. I mean, in many ways, this is the same approach. I'm translating every unprivileged memory access, but I'm, it's, it's also it's trap and inspect, right? When I access something the first time in a process, the operating system gets involved. And the operating system is allowed to look at that and say, OK, this is OK or it's not OK. Right? That's what you guys are doing for assignment three. How do we get good performance here? How do we get this to, to not be incredibly slow? Caching, right? And what, what do we call a cache in virtual memory? TLB, right? All right, so now, now we've brought in the interface we need to, to virtualize, right? Full hardware virtualization. So now what's the interface that, that, I, that I need to virtualize? What's that? No, and it's not the same, actually. Load, store, what's, what's, the, what's the potential interface that I might need to look at? The whole thing. It's the whole hardware instruction set, right? It's the instruction set architecture. Any, any Instruction, I mean, what do instructions do? They modify the state of the machine, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't execute them, right? Uh, you know, uh, MIPS has a no op, but it seems kind of dumb, right? Like, don't do anything, right? But, but the point is that most instructions modify the state of the machine. That's why you, would, that's why you do them in the first place. This is computing. Um, how do we ensure that things are safe? 
What's that? Use VMware? <laughs> Yeah, we use the virtual machine monitor, but, but what does the virtual machine monitor have to be able to do? What's this idea of classical virtualization? So unsafe instructions, right? Instructions that could pierce the VM, right? Instructions that could essentially access, allow things running inside the VM to see other parts of the machine they're not supposed to be able to see have to be caught. Right? And there's a variety of different ways to do it. It depends a lot on what the instruction set architecture is. Trap and emulate is the kind of classic way. And then VMware also does some binary translation. And there are other ways to do this. Right? But the point is that I have to be able to stop things running inside the virtual machine from seeing things outside the virtual machine. Otherwise, I don't have a virtual machine. I just have a leaky process that has weird semantics. Um, and then how do we get good performance? What's, what's the nice trick here that, 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 we, that we can do, the nice trick that we can play? What's the thing that distinguishes virtualization from emulation? Right, so most instructions I can run directly on the physical heart, right? So most instructions do not trap. Most instructions do not need to be inspected. Most instruction sequences don't need to be rewritten, right? So what, what, what's a, just to make sure everybody's awake, well, what's, 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 a con what's an important consequence of this? What, what, what can I not do with the virtualization technology? Right? Or what would make virtualization incredibly slow? Can I write a, like a MIPS virtual machine that runs on an x86 architecture? What's that? You don't want to have to translate every instruction. Right, so I need a match. Right? I need, essentially what I need is, what I, what I want for good performance is I want the instruction set of things that can be run inside the VM safely. It's always a subset of the full instruction set, but I want it to be as large a subset as possible. If I start running a totally different instruction set, then the intersection is zero, right? And essentially it would mean I would have to translate every address, right? And that would be terrible. Right. I mean, that, that, that essentially you're doing emulation. Maybe you can improve it by doing some caching of things you've already translated, but yeah. So the point is that, you know, I emulate, I virtualize x86 on top of x86 hardware, right? I don't virtualize MIPS on top of x86 hardware. That's no longer virtualization because I can, there are no instructions that I can just allow to run on the bare metal because they don't make any sense to the x86, right? Like you tried to call syscall and x86 thinks this is some sort of weird pop operation or whatever. Anyway, it just doesn't make any sense. All right. So, there's, again, if, if you like this sort of stuff, if you're interested in hardware, if you think this is cool, I mean, there's a, still a lot of really interesting uh, research going on in this area. There's a lot of companies that are using this stuff. But there is just really a lot of details that we haven't been able to cover in the two days that we spent talking about this, right? So x86 has these privilege rings, right? So I don't know if we talked about this at all, but x86 has more than just user and kernel mode. It actually has ring 0, ring 1, ring 2, and ring 3. And some virtualization technologies use those multi, and, and each one has access to a different subset of the, arc, of the instruction set, right? So some uh, virtualization approaches use that in order to run the operating system, like the guest OS in ring one, and then the host OS in ring zero, or something like that, right? Um, there are, there's all this interesting stuff that goes into handling page faults, right? Because remember, on x86, the hardware is walking to page tables, so I need to have parallel page table structures that are maintained by the VMM that are called shadow page tables. If you like page translation, this will really blow your mind, right? Because this is like translating accesses to translated accesses to translated accesses, right? It gets like, you know, the diagrams get like, whoa, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and so, and again, it, it, as virtualization has caught on, there's been changes to the instruction set on x86 to make virtualization easier. Right. And, 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 and some of these instructions are, have, are, and this is still happening, right? This is still an active, you know, uh, conversation between the hardware and software communities, right? All right, so on Monday, 8 a.m., here we're going to do exam review. We'll walk through the entire semester. Uh, maybe I'll have some idea of things that are on the exam by then, but I'm not going to promise anything. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but I mean, in general, the exam's going to cover things that we've talked about in class. And Monday, we will be here at 8 a.m., uh, or I will be here at 8 a.m., and you're welcome to come to as much as you would like. Uh, good luck on assignment three. We'll also talk a little bit about Monday on, you know, if you're sticking around UB, what to do next, what other courses you might want to take, and how to continue your budding love affair with operating systems. So I'll see you then. <laughs>